The topic today is gardening for year-round interest. And you know, there is a preconception with native plants that native plants um, look great in the spring when everything is flowering and then it looks dreadful after that or it looks like the wildlands. And you know, some of that is, 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 is kind of true in the sense that the summer months, you know, in the heat of the summer, many native plants, you know, especially from the chaparral community, are really resting. You know, they're not growing. And this is when they have to conserve, you know, their leaves, their water, and make sure they make it through the dry Mediterranean, you know, type of summer climate till it starts raining again. But that doesn't mean that in your garden you cannot have plants of interest, of color. And what I'm going to do today is basically not just restrict myself to summer, but actually walk you through all four seasons and give you examples of plants that look great in those seasons. And you know, a lot of us typically have had or have uh, plants from Europe, from Japan, China, and the East Coast. And these plants, as you know, require a lot of watering in the summer. But these plants also don't really have much flower or interest in the winter. And the, the thing that's special about California native plants is the winter is when it's raining and a lot of them are growing and they actually start flowering in the middle of winter. So some of them are really gorgeous in the winter and you'll see, you know, the manzanita is an example of that. So just, um, I'm not going to really spend too much time on this slide. Uh, Liz did a great job of the introduction. The website for the Santa Clara Valley chapter, of which I'm the secretary, is cnps-scv, which is Santa Clara Valley. It's not Santa Clara County, it's Santa Clara Valley, basically the valley you know, as a region.org. And this is where you need to go for resources on um, you know, all the events that we put on, the wildflower show, the plant sale. There will be a plant sale in October. I don't immediately remember the date off the top of my head. Uh, the plant sale is going to be at Hidden Villa, so it's really close for people who live in Los Altos. So do come to that. And another important thing I'd like to point out is we have guided hikes. So our experts take people on guided hikes. These are free and open to the public, but sometimes you have to email them you know, to say you're coming. So they're looking for you. So please go check out the website and, um, you know, and understand all the events that we have. Now, just a few quick um, things about California that a lot of people don't know about. It's a biodiversity hotspot. What this really means is California actually has nearly 6,000 species, subspecies, and varieties of plants. And this is as much as all the other contiguous United States combined. This is actually a mind-boggling number. And the reason that this is so is because of the unique um, uh, geology and the geography of the state. You know, the, the Sierras, the ocean, the transverse ranges uh, contribute, have contributed to this kind of evolution here. So CNPS's really mission is to try and preserve and conserve this. Uh, as an example, of the 50 species of Ceanothus that exist in Northern California, 41 occur in California. Um, and then um, there are a little over 2,000 species that are endemic, which really means that occur nowhere else on Earth, not just the you know, northern United States. So we have a really unique biofloristic region, and you know, it's our mission to try and protect this region. Um, and as we've talked about this, you know, it stems from the state's unique um, geography, topography, and so on. Okay, so what is attractive? So we will look at this seasonally, as I mentioned already. We will start with winter, where we will really look at bark and form, but you'd be surprised at how many plants are actually flowering in the winter. Spring, you have more flowers, and I have some wildlife pictures. And summer is a lot about foliage and more flowers. And the fall is berries and nuts. And a lot of the native plants are really look gorgeous in the fall. Um, with the dried flowers and the berries. So we'll take a look at some of the pictures. And the handout has, um, I think, all the, all the pictures that I'm going to show you are on your handout. So that's a great place to take notes if you want to jot something down. This is an example of a manzanita. There are so many different varieties of manzanita. But this is Howard McMinn. 
And um, the, the really nice thing about Howard MacMinn is Stanford uses these as hedges all over. So this is a great hedge plant. And if you're going to keep it trimmed as a box hedge, then you won't have this kind of a gorgeous flower display, obviously. But, um, you know, but it, it's a great hedge plant. And you will still get some flowers, not a display like this. So this is a great plant um, to use as a hedge. Arctosaphalus doctor herd is a variety of manzanita, and its its uniqueness is that it's one of the it's not the biggest, but it's one of the manzanitas that actually becomes a small tree. So it will get to about 20 to 25 feet, and as you can see, its bark is really gorgeous. It's one of those plants that will, you know, when it gets to this size, it will take a long time to get the size that you will stop in your tracks and go, what is that tree? And the other nice thing about Dr. Hurd is that it is very garden tolerant. Now those are magic words with native plants that you should remember. When someone describes a California native plant as garden tolerant, that means it will tolerate soils that range from loam to our clay to more sandy soil and will also tolerate extra sprinkling from nearby lawn sprinklers, for example. And uh, so this Dr. Herd is quite garden tolerant. Ceanothus is um, late winter, early spring flowering um, plant usually. And we have so many different varieties of Ceanothus, so many cultivars that it's impossible to actually show you most of them. But Dark Star is one of my favorites. The flowers are kind of a deep cobalt blue and it um, contrasts really well with the early spring blooming poppies if you place the poppies in front of them. So it gives you a gorgeous display in your front yard, for example, up against the house as this picture shows. Let's see, so here's another example of the Cianotus. That was more, uh, the dark star gets to be about four feet, five feet maximum, but four feet, five feet across. The Ray Hotman is one of the Cianothus that can be trained to look like a small tree, but this is uh, not that natural. The tree is not that natural a form for Cianothus in general. And they, you know, they vary from ground cover variety all the way to something like this. And uh, this must have taken a lot of effort, but this is a nice, look at the amount of bloom on that, you know, on that plant. It's just gorgeous. Ah, the western redbud, its range is all the way from here to the 5,000, 6,000 feet of the Sierras. So its range is really large and wide. It, um, it prefers, you know, so it, it, it prefers to not be in full sun. At least the conditions that I've found when it grows in is more kind of a, not a complete understory plant. It requires some amount of sun. Uh, it has, um, it is deciduous, so it doesn't have any leaves that, and then the flowers, this picture doesn't really do it justice because the flowers really are out there blooming before you see any of the leaves. So it's a gorgeous, you know, gorgeous tree in early spring. And then the leaves are, you know, very nice and delicate looking the rest of the year. And there's a picture later on of what the, the, the seed pods look like in the fall. And they are pink as well, so it's you know it's a great small tree or a big you know big bush plant to have in your garden. The red twig dogwood um, really is all about the color of the twig, and um, this is um, the reason I have this on this, this slide set is I like, you know some of you. I think some of you, maybe all of you, live in the Los Altos area. I know there are more creeks around here. This is really a creek plant. So if you have a creek, and you know, this is what you would, you know, one of the things that you can plant creek side, and it, it will spread. It'll spread um, not that fast. It's not invasive, but you know, medium speed, and it has these gorgeous red uh, twigs. Currants and gooseberries. We have a, you know, again, the native plants. There are a large number of currants and gooseberries in, you know, in the in the list. I'm not going to show you all of them, but here are, you know, so 
The first thing is that gooseberries are the ones that have the thorns, and the currants are the ones that don't have the thorns. And secondly, um, they are all deciduous, and they have flowers in the early spring, and most of the flowers are gorgeous, and then they have berries in the, in the fall time. So they are a great plant to have, and the reason why we must combine evergreen and deciduous plants in our garden is the deciduous plants provide much needed leaf lit litter for birds and for, you know, um, basically for the microorganisms in the soil to, um, to develop to their natural ecological state. So if you have a garden that's all evergreens, or if you hire a mow and blow gardener who blows every single leaf away from your garden, that is really bad for the garden. You really need to let some of the leaves stay on the soil, and that helps the soil actually develop to its healthiest state. And if you want to encourage birds to come nest or even visit your garden, and leaving that leaf litter is what attracts them. You know, then they're in there early morning, scooting around, looking for insects, and you know, doing their usual stuff. So, now I highly recommend um, some currants and gooseberries. They will grow as an understory. It's a dry, they will grow in dry um, conditions. So they're a great plant to use under oaks and trees that uh, are not watered in the summer. By the way, this is interactive, so feel free to ask me questions in the middle. I don't want to, I feel like I'm lecturing, and I don't want to feel like I'm lecturing. <laughs> can, you, can you just tell us when you have these big blooming um, bushes, what season that might be? This is all winter and early spring right now. Okay, so I haven't act, I've actually got to my spring section, so this is all winter, Thank so you. it's late winter, right? Yeah. This is just another example of, uh, this is the uh, Ribis aureum. Uh, that one was Ribis um, glutinosum sanguinium, which is the pink flowering. And then aureum is the golden flower. And I have this in my garden. I have the other one too, but I have this in my garden. It's very slow growing is what I've noticed. Or I have it in a condition where it's very slow growing, I suspect. Um, so, but I'm, I'm not quite sure at what rate it really grows. So here's something that I threw in for the bark interest. This is the Western Sycamore. It's a huge tree. It can get to be a really huge tree. But it has, in my opinion, you know, some people might not like it or like it. I think this bark is really gorgeous. And um, especially since you see the bark in sort of filtered shade. And that lends it even more character, I think. So this is a great tree to plant. Um, it does need some water to get it, you know, to grow and stay, stay big. But it's a great tree to use uh, instead of the standard East Coast white birch that everyone plants in their lawn. This would be a great alternative um, to have. Is it primarily a riparian plant? Um, <sighs> You know, it's not something that I would call riparian, but it's often growing by stream side. And I think it sends its, you know, roots, you know, out down into the soil. So it's more a plant that, more a tree that grows where the water table is high. Mm -hmm. I would think of it that way rather than as riparian. Mm -hmm. So I'm not exactly sure how high the water table is in Los Altos, but at Palo Alto where I live, the water table is really high. You know, it is 10 feet down. I know one of our neighbors, dug you know, into the ground to build a basement, and they pumped water out of that for about three years. Wow. You know, so the water table is really high there. Yeah. So you know, I suspect it's also high here. Yeah. And, it, and because this, it's hilly too, so it, it really depends on where you are. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I think a, really, a, a reasonable thing to do would be to get it started with water, you know, but when it's a reasonable size, 10 feet, I think it'll probably do quite fine. Because by, by, by the time it's 10 feet, its roots are probably 20 feet down there. So don't plant next to your sewer line, though. <laughs> um, you can if you have replaced your sewer line with a modern you know, <laughs> plastic where the roots cannot penetrate them, which okay. we have to do. <laughs> Not because of this one, but because of something else from a neighbor's house, yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so we're on to spring, and this is, you know, a lot of this can be about flowers, flowers, and more flowers, but it threw in some wildlife too, so, you know, to make it more interesting. And um, this is actually a picture of my pond, the way it looked two years ago. <laughs> this picture hasn't been updated. So a lot of these plants have grown much bigger now, and the pond looks very different. You know, every year it looks very different. So there are, you know, I've... Not everything here is native, but I have you know a few natives. This is the Lilium perdalinum and um, the leopard lily, and I have cardinal uh, Mimulus cardinalis. That's the red monkey flower, and the hummingbirds come to it all the time. And I don't know if you can see it or it's even visible. It's pretty small two years ago. I have an Epipactus gigantea, which is the California tree market in there, and it has these little brown flowers. Um, and I have a few other things. There's a mountain, um, picanthinum something, a mountain mint here, and there's some um, mugwort back there. Oh, there it is, actually, really big. And um, my garden is a mix of natives, some pre-existing non-natives, and some edibles, and I think that was a pomegranate that I had planted. And this, Grass area has now been replaced by a native meadow, so I'm building a native meadow there. Um, and this wasn't even turf grass. This was some seeds that thrown, and you know, um, my family is not very happy with the native meadow. They want a place. My daughter wants a place to somersault, and she says, "I can't somersault in your meadow. <laughs> That's too bad." <laughs> and the goldfish is now gone. I think some birds came and took them. You know, there's a heron that comes by frequently. So, you know, it's, it's a changing, changing ecosystem. But this year I have 100,000 blue dragonflies. So they obviously laid their eggs there last year and they're continuing to hatch, you know, every week. So, the kind of things that can make your garden interesting, um, you know, plant milkweeds for the butterflies, for example. And one thing to note, I went to um, a talk by Nancy Bauer last year. In fact, I think I hosted the talk. And a point that she made, which I hadn't really quite uh, internalized, was when you plan for wildlife, you cannot just plant one plant. You know, when you're planting for a butterfly, you, know, you don't plant one milkweed. Mm -hmm. You will have to actually plant a few. She said a minimum of three. So you have to have you know, a cluster. You know, I think she called it you know, grouping and clusters of plants if you want to attract that wildlife. And unfortunately, we live in wildlife, you know, d deserts, right? Because our neighbors don't have the same plan. So, you know, go to your neighbor's house and see if you can get them to plant three milkweeds. You know, build a wildlife corridor in your block. Um, the um, native bee in a poppy, this is a picture I took in my garden a year ago. And, you know, of course, it's always interesting to see that the bees turn the color of the, you know, flowers, pollen that they're feeding on, so it starts off at a, a slightly off color maybe, and then by the end of the season, the bees are all looking the same color as the poppy. It's an interesting transformation. Um, these are bees um, in the foothills of the Sierras in um, um, the Harlequin lupine. Yeah, that's what that was. And more pictures of uh, birds. Um, okay, so what you can do in the spring is you can have some bulbs in your garden. And there's a whole, actually there's so many native bulbs and forbs available and there are good resources now that you can get these at. Um, and um, the, the, the meadow onion, the allium unifolium is, is great. Um, it's a great bulb. They are so easy to grow. You plant, put them in the fall, and then they come up year after year. And um, I have so many of these in my meadow. And you know, indeed, they are really easy to grow. Our clarkias um, are, are all annuals and annual wildflowers, and there are so many different kinds of clarkias. But this is Clarkia mona. And Liz, our kind host, brought a whole bunch of uh, flowers from some of the plants that I'm talking about today. So when I'm done talking, you know, feel free to go to the table and look at some of those flowers. 
there's some clarkia ammonia there as well. How she got them to bloom this late in the season, I'm not quite sure, but you know, this is magic hands. So this is um, <clears throat> Carpenteria californica, or called the bush anemone. It is endemic to one small region in the south central Sierras, just east of Fresno. And they grow nowhere else on Earth. And an interesting story I like to tell about them is nearly one and a half centuries ago, the English discovered this in California and they took it back to England. And they love this plant so much that, you know, apparently it is quite commonly available in English nurseries. Um, I have not personally seen this, but this is what I've heard. And from a distance, it looks like white camellia, but it's, it's really a gorgeous flower. I've seen it in the wild in the Sierras, and um, it's amazing the different conditions that they grow in. I've seen a bush right in the middle of the Highway 168, you know, off Toll House Road, east of Fresno, right in the middle of the divide. There's a big bush standing by itself in full sun. It gets to be 100 degrees there, right? Today it's 108 degrees there. They grow right in that heat. And I've seen them in the understory of, you know, of bigger plants like the, um, like the bay, you know, the bay leaves. So they seem to grow in all kinds of conditions up on the hills. St. Catherine's lace is Iriogonum gigantium. This plant gets really big. I don't know if this photograph does it justice, but if you have a big space that you want to fill, then use this. Because then, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's your shot at filling the space with one plant. And there are two samples there. Um, of just cuttings of the flowers, you know, obviously not the whole plant, and uh, gives you a view of what this looks like. And from a distance, when the flowers are clustered like that, it's actually quite a uh, magnificent sight. Douglas iris, iris Douglas again, it's one of my favorites. Um, the sore, I mean, it's a typical iris, you know, sore like green, dark green leaves that. Um, year after year grow in ever enlarging circles. And you can divide them in a couple of years. You know, just take a sharp spade only in the fall after it starts raining, cut it clean through, you can take it and move it somewhere else. Uh, so they're easy to propagate, they're fairly easy to grow as long as you don't water them in the summer. And they give you, in April, they give you beautiful flowers. Um, Pacific Coast, PCH, Pacific Coast Hybrids, is what a lot of nurseries sell these hy them as hybrids. So if you buy a plant without a flower on it, you don't know what the flower's color is going to be until it flowers in April. So if you want to, you know, if you want a specific flower color, buy them in April when it's flowering. Uh, the best way to get these plants is to make friends with people who have native plants in their garden. <laughs> And visit them in the fall with a pie. <laughs> is it worth allowing them to go to seed? I usually did have them, and this year I let the pods grow. Right. You know, I haven't personally tried growing them from seed, but I know people who have. And, you know, have you, Steve? So Steve has. So I think they do grow from seed. They're also easy to propagate by dividing. So they're an easy to propagate plant and they give you good coverage. When they're done flowering, the green you know, leaves on the ground stay all year round. You know, just a little cleaning if some leaf litter is falling into them. So it's one of my favorites. Um, <clears throat> Sticky monkey flower, Mimulus. This is a particular variety. They come in all kinds of colors, but the, the native straight species is, is this is some sort of an orange color. And you'll see them all over the hillsides if you drive on 101 South, if you hike in Edgewood Park. They seem to grow in huge numbers and flower profusely for a long time. Um, as long as you, um, you know, as long as you give them adequate water in the early years when they're getting established and they're on, um, on a slope that has sufficient drainage so the roots don't stay soggy and wet, they will do well for you. Ah, we are in summer. So how are we doing on time? I think we're doing great. Okay, so summer is all about foliage and flowers. And summer is also the time when, you know, if you are the ardent native plant gardener in your house and the rest of your family is not, your family gives you grief. 
Okay. Uh, speaking from personal experience. And um, you can manage that by, you know, judiciously using plants that look great in the summertime as well. Artemisia, this particular one, David's Choice, doesn't get as big, and it has this neat form. You know, it looks like it's been shared by some expensive, you know, mow and blow gardener, you know, carefully every week. But it's a great plan to use in front, where it gives this neat appearance all year round. The western hazelnut is, uh, I wouldn't call this a plant, I would call this more a small tree. And, um, you know, it, what's really nice about the western hazelnut is um, it, uh, it actually gives a great um, kind of, a, what is that, it's, it, it looks, it gives the look of a small temperate rainforest just in the area where it's planted. So it looks, you know, it has this kind of a thick growth, and the leaves are in this nice green color, and the flowers have this interesting looking shape. And if there's an area where you want to actually cover something ugly, you know, you have a, you know, an air conditioner or something, or, you know, a neighbor's, you know, kitchen window or something like that on your side of the fence, this is a great, uh, this is a great plant. Um, the Polystichum nunitum, the western sword fern, is, 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 a, is a fern that um, requires less water than most other ferns. But that doesn't mean it will grow with no water. You do need to give it some water in the summer. Um, by some water, I would say I water it about once every two weeks in the summer. You know, it's very close to, I planted it very close to my hose, so I just, when I walk around the garden, I just give it some water about once every two weeks but it's fairly drought tolerant by all standards. Um, a, a very drought tolerant fern, and it looks nice. And is it mostly a shade plant? It is a shade plant, yes. Mm -hmm. I, um, when I originally planted mine, it was about 15 feet from my neighbor's pine and it didn't do really very really well. I think the pine roots, I think the pine was just sucking up the water from probably 50 feet around. But that, that the neighbor cut those pines down. There were eight pines planted three feet apart. And they were oh big gosh. Montre pines. So I kept saying, you know, there's a right place and for, for trees and plants. And you know, these are too close and they're getting too big. And, and so they did cut the pines down. So I'm noticing a big difference in my fern's behavior. The leaves are now greener, with the same amount of water, mind you, right? Maybe they just needed more water before, and I'm, I'm, I'm very reluctant with watering. You know, I'm, I torture my plants. I just let them go as long as possible before I water them. So they really did not do well when the pine was nearby. The sulfur buckwheat, no, we don't have the sulfur buckwheat there. And this picture is actually a little strange. Um, it was a close-up, and I think there was too much sunshine on this one. So it doesn't really, this is not a true representation, no. I don't think I have another picture. So the sulfur buckwheat is really a very yellow buckwheat. And it's from the Shasta area, a little bit more Northern California. It's not really local to us. Uh, but it provides a great yellow color in the summertime when it's difficult to get yellow from anything else. So, you know, so we do use it locally, even though it's not a local native, and it, it you know, it has this nice yellow color. Buckwheats, by the way, is what flowers in the summer. So, you know, use a variety of buckwheats. This is the, you know, the straight California buckwheat, um, Eriogonum fasciculatum, and the straight buckwheat is really um, white off white, um, and, um, it's, you know, it can be a gorgeous um, head of flowers on the plant. It looks like that. And um, it's a great wildlife plant. Butterflies love this. So it's a great plant to have in the garden. The Lavatera, the Mission Mallow, is um, one of the mallows. Most of the mallows, mind you, do get really big. So again, before you plant a mallow, just make sure you have the space for that bush. And this particular one is 
has this really deep purple flower and it's gorgeous. I don't know how easy it is to get this deep, you know, deep purple uh, flower variety though. The fall. Um, the fall is really all about berries and nuts and how the plant of the tree looks. Um, so there are some pictures of photographs of plants that I've shown you already in other seasons that you'll see here. This is the California fuchsia, Epilobium. There are so many different varieties of the California fuchsia. And they will fill um, a ground cover need all the way up to you know plants that get five feet, four feet, six feet high. So you just have to find the right variety that fits your need and plant it. And um, you cut them way back in the late winter. You know, you cut it off, just leave an inch at the bottom. And then in the spring, they send out new leaves and um, they give you gorgeous late summer flowers into the fall and sometimes they're still flowering by end of October. <coughs> so, and, uh, and this is what the hummingbirds will come to your garden for in the late summer and through the fall. It's a great hummingbird plant. Now another interesting and useful uh, fact to know about the California fuchsia is most of these fuchsia plants will, eat, will propagate very easily from a cutting. So if you just break off a piece and put it in the soil, they'll grow there. And I know this because you know I've had a basketball break off pieces of mine from the front yard, and you know it pushes, it hits a piece out to the side, and I have a plant growing there the next spring. So you know it's easy to propagate. So just use a basketball. This one spreads like mad. It's my experience. do you? I mean, it really depends on. Oh, this particular one. Yeah, it's gone from nothing to about four feet in two years. Right. And do you water in the summer? Do you water no. in the summer? Not much. Maybe once a month at most. Right, yeah. So that's a great thing about this plant. It's really drought tolerant. So it only really, once you've established it, it only needs to be watered about once a month in the summer. And uh, so it has lots of good properties and it can fill an area like um, what she said. Oh, we're, you know, here's another buckwheat. I've shown you a couple of pictures of buckwheat. I should have put this with the other one. This is the Grande uh, Rubicense, and I think there are two varieties, uh, maybe one variety there or two varieties. Uh, you can take a look at what they look like. Uh, they are flowering now, basically in my, in my yard as well, and they're a great butterfly plant and great for wildlife. I see bees buzzing around it, native bees around it all the time. Um, and uh, they're easy to grow usually as long as you don't um, um, you know, let something else crowd it out. I let two of mine get crowded out by poppies one year, not paying attention, and it did crowd it out. The poppies can be quite aggressive. So next year I was in there, but then I had lost those two. But they, they give you these, you know, the, the flowers turn into these brown uh, flowers and you can leave that brown flower on the plant right through the winter for interest, winter interest, right? So, and, okay, the good thing about not deadheading everything, you know, as soon as they're done flowering is they provide valuable food for birds. So, was that a question? I have what I think of those, but they're pink. They have a really pink flower on them. It is a really pink flower. Oh, yeah, okay. it is, right. yeah. Yeah. Yes? Um, on the Shasta buckwheat, uh -huh. um, or sulfur, sulfur, buckwheat, sulfur. Mm -hmm. um, the yellow one, when they flower, when they finish flowering, uh, they don't flower again, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I've got one flower left. So, when, so I should just leave, because I want to see the, I, I know they turn very beautiful. Right, you know, they right. They turn beautiful color brown. <coughs> And, but I thought if I did have them, more flowers will come? I usually not the buckwheats, no. I have done that with the poppies. So if you actually go and, you know, trim the poppies off, they are actually giving me a second bloom right now. The second bloom is usually a little smaller, so the flowers are a little smaller, but they do give you the second bloom. And so the bees are actually back in the poppies now. But these, I don't think they flower again. Um, and, um, and, it's, it's, and you also get a lot of seeds from it. So you know you let this 
you know, the, the pink flower dry, brown, and then you can collect seeds, you know, maybe just before it starts raining, before it gets wet or something. Um, and then in December, we have a special program called the Seed Exchange. So come to the Seed Exchange, you know, bring seeds or don't bring seeds, bring cuttings or don't bring cuttings, but it's a great place to come and hang out. There's usually a talk and people bring extra seeds of all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, you can take some back home and, you know, try to propagate something else in your garden. Um, there's so many plants that are easy to propagate, but, you know, some are not. So many, of, many of the California, uh, you know, natives, you have to be careful, they require special things like fire to get them to propagate again. So you have to just know there is a great book that you can get. Uh, it's on our resources website. Ah, the toyon. So the, the toyon, you know, the berries from the toyon um, are really quite gorgeous in the fall. And again, a great uh, food source for the cedar wax wings especially. And they are, um, um, you know, they are quite attracted to them and there's usually a noisy interchange around this tree, you know, in, in the fall time. Which is, you know, if you like birds and you want them to come to your garden, then this is a great plant to have. Now this is also a great small tree for um, privacy hedge between you and a neighbor. So if you have a fence and you want something to get a little taller than the fence to provide privacy, you know, you can plant a row of these. They are evergreen. And you know, um, this, is, this is the plant, the tree that uh, called, got Hollywood its name, right? So they arrived there, looked at the hillside, and saw these trees with red berries all over it. They thought it was holly, and they called it Hollywood. But it's actually the Toyon. Um, I don't think there's anything left there. I'm not sure, but you know, certainly before. I was just wondering about the Toyon. Oh. Are, these, uh, are these edible at all? Um, no, not for human. Um, it won't kill you if you eat a few. I will give it to your child. Um, and the, the, you know, after the cedar wax wings have eaten a few of those, you can see them kind of drunkenly walking around. So, you know, if a little bird gets a little drunk, it won't kill you, but, you know, it's not really edible. Um, some of the ribes are edible, not all the ribes are edible either. So check the resources, you know, before you eat any berries. Um, there are so many edible native berries, you know, there's the native evergreen huckleberry, it's a very slow growing plant, but the berry is edible. There is, um, what am I thinking, there are so many, yes Steve? Blue elderberry, it's in, Oh yeah, the it's blue elderberry, right yeah, it's actually there's a plant. picture coming of the okay. blue elderberry. Um, so. uh, the, 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 all, all the uh, uh, currants? All the, not all of them, I well, think uh, some, the, of the them are, of some of them are more edible than yeah. others. Uh, this is the coffee berry. Here's another berry. Again, not an edible berry for people, but a great food source for birds. And the, the, straight, um, the straight species is actually a really big plant. You know, you need the space to plant the big one. But there is a compact variety you can get. Uh, Eve's case, I think the compact variety is called. And it, it, it'll stay to within four feet or so. Um, but the berries are kind of a pink red magenta color and they are gorgeous. Ah, uh, the buckeye. Uh, the California buckeye, you see them everywhere around these parts, especially around Stanford, between Page Mill and Foothill Expressway and off 280 ramp there. So they are very common around here. They, you will often find them growing stream side, um, not too far from you know, a seep or a water source because they need that. Um, and if you find them growing on a dry hillside, that probably meant there was a water seep there before when they were young, and they got established, and the water source just moved away. Um, the buckeye seeds are certainly not edible. The native um, uh, Americans uh, process them and use them to stun the fish in the streams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that tells you that they have something in them, like a neurotoxin, that you don't probably want to mess with. They yeah. have tannic acid, and you know, like, like oh, uh, acorns, but right. acorns have less. 
they would eat, Native Americans would eat those, but that requires a lot of A lot of leaching, right. A lot requires a lot of leaching than, right. than the acorns. <laughs> so. Right. And um, not a preferred food. Not appropriate, not a preferred food. But the seeds are really gorgeous. Someone here has used them as a little, you know, decoration, um, decoration plate. And they're easy to grow from seed. You do want to grow them from seed. You know, just bury them about an inch inside the soil so the squirrels don't find them and, you know, bite in them or insects don't bite them off, the beetles don't bite them off. Um, and then that's what, you know, that's a picture of this, you know, the, the pods hanging on the tree. Oh, and if you plant a buckeye, you must know that the leaves all fall off about now. Um, mid to end July is when the leaves fall. That's their, that's their drought tolerant mechanism. That's how they conserve, make sure they make it through the, the, the warm summer. And you shouldn't be uh, surprised if your neighbors come to you and tell you, you have a dead tree in your front yard. <laughs> and then you tell them, no, that's a buckeye. You know, it just looks that way. I have a neighbor who, have, who inherited a buckeye when they moved in there that's just been pruned so gorgeously. It has this, when the leaves fall, it has this beautiful shape. You know, it's just, you know, so you can do that. How much and, space do you need for a buckeye? They grow pretty big, don't they? You know, in the wild, I mean, certainly off Stanford, you know, you've seen buckeyes that look like they're about 120 feet high. Mm -hmm. But this neighbor's tree is no more than about 20, 25, and I think they keep it at that. Uh -huh. So it's so been pruned. I think they are pruning it because uh, I should have a conversation with her one day. But, you know, I think it can be kept small. Uh, not very small, though. It does tend, it does want to get bigger. Um, but I've seen buckeyes in all kinds of sizes and shapes, so. Okay, so we saw the western redbud with the pink flowers in the spring. This is the fall um, seed pods. And again, it's pink and it's gorgeous. And this is an unusually large western redbud. You don't often see them this size. Um, they're usually much smaller and slower growing. We have one grower who's uh, an active uh, poster on the GWN group who, who says he has some varieties that are faster growing in his nursery. So you know, you can, if you want a faster growing variety, you can go get it from him. Uh, Pete, where you? So I haven't tried them personally. So this is the Western hazelnut. You know, we saw the you know, spring picture. And this is what the hazelnut looks like in the fall. I don't think we saw the spring picture of the Mahonia or the Berberis equifolium. These are the, um, the spring flowers, the yellow flowers, and this is the fall berry. This berry actually is edible. Uh, you can eat this berry, but it's not, I mean, you don't, people, I don't find people bake it into a pie or anything like that. You don't eat huge amounts. You can eat a few as you're walking through your garden. And the leaves are quite sharp. So you usually plant them away from the edge of a path, and they really prefer to be in shade. So this is the kind of environment you plant them. And it also, although the, um, the straight species will get quite big and tall, there are compact and um, creeping varieties. There is a compacta repens, uh, Mahonia uh, aquifolium repens, that is, is a small variety. I have that one. And what's nice about that one is the leaves turn kind of a copper bronze color in the fall, and it's, it's a very gorgeous looking little plant, and um, it's a nice one. Ah, so Steve mentioned the, the blue elderberry, the Sambucus mexicana, and um, it's um, left, to, you know, left to its natural thing. It actually has you know, multiple branches that come out from the base like that. It's not a single trunk standard, um, typically. And it has these big, um, you know, bigger than my palm sometimes, um, head of these white flowers in the spring. And you do see them everywhere, you know. You don't actually notice them when they're not flowering. So you might drive by them, you know, Unipur or Sarah, any of these roads, and you won't see them, but you will see them in the spring. And they turn into these um, blue elderberries <clears throat> in the fall. And this is a great, um, this is an edible berry. And I know people who actually do make elderberry wine and who make, um, this is not the elderberry that the English 
make elderberry wine with, but I know someone who's tried to make elderberry wine with this. I think it, it turned out to be more elderberry juice by the time it was done, but that might be just um, his winemaking skills, I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, it, is, you know, it is edible. And the birds come to this, so don't take all the berries for yourself, leave some for the birds. Yeah. Is that deciduous or? No, it is not. Yeah, it's kind of a semi-deciduous. Um, yeah. It is deciduous? Yeah. I've seen it to be more semi-deciduous. I guess it depends on where it is. Um, another interesting thing about the, the elderberry is that the, the natives used to coppice it every year because the, the flexible stem that grew the next year is what they would take to weave their baskets with. So, you know, so it is a tree that will take every year. It will come right back. So, I went to this really interesting talk. In fact, I think it was here in Los Altos by the lady who did the Ohlone basket weaving. And uh, she's the one who told us about this. Late fall, the, 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 the California grape, the whitest California, Rogers read, I think it was last year that they established that this is a cross between two. One is a non-native, one is a native. So it isn't 100% native, but it does have these leaves that turn a gorgeous red in the late fall, and then it all falls, and then you have the wine, and then next year it grows again, and uh, it is really vigorous. Don't plant this if you don't have the space for it, but if you have an arbor that you want to cover every year consistently, then go ahead and plant this one. Um, I know someone who has this in her yard, and she controls it with the amount of water she supplies every summer. So you can control its growth. If you water it regularly, it will grow a foot a day. I'm not kidding. But you know you control its growth by not watering it. And it has <clears throat> small grapes that are edible, and the birds love it too. So yeah, it's beautiful looking. I know someone who grows this on the back fence. A back fence is um, behind. There's a creek back there, but the back fence is maybe. 500 feet long, and I know she starts it at one end, and it goes probably almost to the other end. Um, so it is a very vigorous plant. Yeah. Carolyn Curtis said she made wine out of her Rogers Red grapes, and without the skins, but the flesh is so dark that the wine came out really dark and rich. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've heard her say that. Oh, that's that's interesting to know. So. Okay, so the coast live oak. This is one of three or four common varieties of oaks that you see around here. Uh, many of you, if you live here, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills area, the, this is the one that you see most often. And um, it is an oak, so the understory needs to stay dry in the summer. So if you find an oak growing in, you know, in your garden and you have a, someone has planted a lawn under it, and if you keep watering that lawn all summer, that oak will eventually die um, much sooner than you know than its ex you know life expectancy. So an oak needs the proper care. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you. I know there are a couple of you who were at Barry Coates' talk at Campbell in June, but uh, he spent a, a lot of time talking about California oaks and the use of California oaks in a, you know in a, in a home garden. And his talk is on the website. You know, Steve has videotaped it and put it there. So, you know, it's a great place to go, you know, get more information about the oaks. So that is basically my talk, and we went through the four seasons, and I showed you some pictures. But the native plants are really, you know, there are quite a few native plants here, and I've just gone through a small subset. And uh, do use all the resources that we have made available on our website, come to more talks. We have plant lists. Um, many of the speakers have plant lists that they provide with their talks, which Steve puts the PDF right next to the link to the YouTube video. So go download those plant lists, and you can get a ton of information. And I'd be happy to answer more questions if there are any. Yeah? Um, besides the ones that you mentioned that aren't locally native, it seems to me that you put a lot of locally native is that, is that right? That is right. You know, what, I, you know, what I'm trying to do, you know, uh, I'm, 
I think, you know, all of us are hopefully growing in our thinking. And from two years ago, one of the things that I'm trying to be more conscious about is trying to find source more locally native plants. The, you know, one of the things I didn't talk about um, in the California, you know, when I talked about the floristic province and so many species of plants is that California is also unique in that many of these plants are really sometimes endemic to that area. Some plants go all over, right? But some plants are really endemic, and it's great to kind of stay within your local area and use those combinations because the local flora and fauna have really evolved together over millions of years. And having that grouping available in your garden or in you know, public gardens is invaluable to bring back the bees and the butterflies and the microorganisms in the soil. And so I'm trying to be more conscious um, about trying to stay with locally native plants. And with the exception, perhaps, of the sulfur buckwheat, um, I think I'm just quickly going through the list in my head. Which one? Carpentaria. And the Carpentaria. Um, everything else is really locally native. And there are many more that are locally native. If you want to just stay with locally native, this is not the only set. But um, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, Photo credits uh, go to Sherry Osaka, Arvind, and myself. I'm um, on all the stuff, and I have a website that I, you know, that I spent six months writing information content for a few years ago. I've not been super active keeping it up to date, but it has a lot of good information in there, especially if you're trying to um, convert out of a lawn. So I have information in there on how to sheet compost your lawn and how to, you know get away from a lawn, so you know, go look that up if you want information. Uh, I know uh, Liz introduced me as a native plant designer, but again, that's not something that I'm doing really actively at the moment. I'm really very involved with CNPS and volunteering, doing these talks and things like that. Um, my other life is really in the tech business, <laughs> so you know, I've been a little active on the tech side recently. Yeah. I uh, thought I'd mention, you know, my favorite way of learning about native plants is to go out into your favorite park right. or your favorite local uh, native garden and see what people have done. You know, someone mentioned uh, Ulasek. Right. And they, you, know, you had a dark star there. Right. And they have planted some dark star uh, next to some California sagebrush. And the two make a stunning pair, the really dark leaves of the Ceanothus and this light gray, gray fuzzy, uh, of, yeah. of the uh, uh, sagebrush. Um, same thing, say California sagebrush and uh, the sticky monkey flower. You see it all the time out in nature and they look gorgeous together. Yeah, I would highly recommend that you take some of our free guided walks in the local parks, you know, and then you can see what nature is growing together. And, you know, that's what, you know, we're trying to use as inspiration to bring back into our home gardens, because that's the combination that works, that works for the insects, that works for the soil, that works for the microorganisms, and that works together as well. Um, and especially the walks in springtime, you know, because it's still, it's the, the, the temperature is still not this, this high, the flowers are out, and you know, everything has this clean, washed look from the winter, hopefully if it rains. Um, so that's a great time to do the walks. Uh, yeah, just a few resources here. Um, you know, uh, the, the California Native Plants for the Garden is the closest equivalent we have to uh, the Sunset Garden book, you know, but for native plants. Um, it has a wide range of um, you know, selection that you can look at. It will not actually tell you about your locally native plants, though, but we have other resources for that. Um, I do not often remember the website name, the Cal Flora. Uh, Cal Flora, uh, Berkeley, Cal, just, you know, go to a favorite internet search engine and type in Berkeley Cal Flora just plant Calfor list or yeah, something. Calflora.org. And when you get to Calfor. the website, okay. when, when you get there, there's a link on the left-hand side that says 
what grows here. And you can uh, find yourself on the map. You can zoom in and out of the map to make it bigger or smaller to include more or less plants. And it's really easy to use, and you'll find just what you want. Right, and you can search by criteria. You can search by riparian, that is stream side. Yeah. You can search by chaparral. You can search by plant community. Native, you can search -native. by neighborhoods. You can yeah. search with the city name. You can put in Los Altos. You can search with county, yeah. you know, Santa Clara County. So there are other resources out there. Join the Gardening with Natives Yahoo group. It's a very um, active and very, um, you know, good, you get good responses to questions and, you know, go check the archives of that as well. And some, you know, organizations that you can join. Yeah? What do you look under to see these videos on YouTube? Okay, so you go to cnps-scv.org okay. and there's a link there called education. No. Steve's going to tell us. Pre, pre, I think it's presentations, or oh no, yes, it's education. education. And then and under education, there are five or six, you know, menu items. And then presentations. And then you go to presentations. Thank you. Right okay. now, the, 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 the top article on the home page will take you right there. Okay. 